Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Don't despise the day of small things, and don't be overly impressed by big numbers. I travel all over the world. I speak to sometimes thousands of people, sometimes to small groups like this. I don't chase two things or three things I'm told by the Lord not to chase. Don't chase numbers, don't chase money. Obviously, don't chase women, but don't chase fame either. Uh, in the last month, now what are the odds of this happening? In the last month, the biggest evangelical church in North America, in the United States and Canada together, the biggest, 42,000 adult members in the main branch, not counting the satellites, not counting children, 42,000 in the main branch. When my mother lived in Florida, her mother's family is from Donegal, but she lives uh, in New Jersey now, but when she lived in Florida, I used to go to this church. And there were traffic jams every Sunday morning on the motorway, on the interstate, of the police with the lights on trying to control the traffic jams of people trying to get to church. 42,000 in the main branch of this church in Florida, Calvary Chapel, uh, Fort Lauderdale. 42,000 adults. Not counting kids, not counting satellites. Biggest evangelical church in North America. And the biggest evangelical church in Asia, the Bible Belt of Asia, is Korea, South Korea. The biggest evangelical church in Asia, in Seoul. The pastor of both of them, one was criminally convicted as a swindler, and the other was found to be a serial adulterer, a womanizer. Public scandals on television, in the newspapers, all over the internet. Within three weeks of each other, the biggest evangelical church in the United States, in North America, in fact, and the biggest in Asia, the heads of both pastors rolled. Within three weeks of each other. That's within the last month. It's within the last month. Very distressing. It's nothing I take any joy in, but the world sees it. It's on television, it's in the newspapers, you can't deny it's happening. Is the biggest. The church that has been involved with the youth in America within the last month now, Mars Hill, they called it. The pastor there, well, again, not throwing mud, I'm just stating a fact. He likes using vulgarity. I have no problem discussing sexual issues from a biblical perspective, but I just don't see the need for vulgar terminology when doing so, at least not in, certainly not in church. He wrote a book on the Song of Solomon, and he was caught in plagiarism, publicly caught in plagiarism. He was caught plagiarizing, it was Mark Driscoll. Now what it comes out, this is within the last month, it took $220,000, right, it takes 200,000 euros, and he pays companies to buy copies of his book in order to artificially get it on the bestseller lists. <laughs> this is just within the last month. You understand these are the biggest churches. These are the biggest churches that everybody looks to and emulates. And their heads roll so quickly. Like a house of cards, it all just comes crumbling. But people chase the numbers and they think God must be blessing because it's big. I wish that was always the case. I wish that was always the case. But it isn't. Over the years, I have seen one mega church after another collapse. One after another. The first mega church that everybody wants to imitate, you have people in court now trying to get American megachurches by imitating the American marketing psychology, 
They're doing it in court. The first one to do that was the Crystal Cathedral, Robert Schuller, the first megachurch. All the other ones, like Rick Warren and, and Bill Hybels, imitated him. He was the first. His church collapsed $56 million in debt. The Roman Catholic Church just bought the Crystal Cathedral for a pittance. Now they're holding mass and novenas in it. This was the biggest mega, first mega church. But everybody looked to it. That was the role model. We want to be like him. This goes back. I remember the biggest ministry in the world. The biggest in the world at the time was the PTL Club. Primetime TV, satellite TV and radio, a mega church, and if you can believe it, the third biggest theme park in the world, a Christian Disneyland. In one day, in one day, financial and sexual scandal. Then, of course, everybody was going to Toronto, Canada. That was going to be the big revival. There was no revival. What's left of that place? Nothing. So they tried to clone it in Pensacola, Florida. After a financial scandal and a big split, what was left of that place? Then they tried it in Lakeland with the tattooed goon who kicked the old ladies in the face. They were all prophesying over him. I'm only stating facts. They did this on TV. Wendy Borealic, they were there prophesying. Peter Wagner and Rick Joyner and Bill Johnson, they were prophesying over this guy with the tattoos who was a criminally convicted homosexual pedophile. And they prophesied he was going to lead the Great Revival. This was two years ago. The whole time he was a serial adulterer and after they prophesied over him, 72 hours later, he leaves his wife and three children, takes off with another woman, divorces his Christian wife, who was handicapped, abandons his kids, marries this other woman he ran off with. Now she's prophesying with him. In an openly adulterous marriage, she's prophesying with them, and Rick Joyner rehabilitated you understand how ridiculous it is? That these are the biggest churches that everybody is imitating and emulating and looking to. One after another, they go down. One after another. And I mean thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people. Now I see people in Ireland and in Cork trying to imitate something. Why do you want to imitate something that is not of God? Something that is not going to last. Unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. Oh, you can build a church, a sizable church, on entertainment and hype and compromised doctrine. You can build it, <clears throat> but you can't make it stand. If you use entertainment to draw people, you're going to have to use entertainment to keep people. No, I'm not putting down big numbers. I'm not putting down big numbers when God adds to their numbers. When churches grow because people are being convicted of their sin and being saved, praise God. But when people are leaving one show for another, Often one freak show for another. When that show is over, they go find another show. I've seen the biggest in the world, one after another, that everybody's talking about. They're all the rage. Everybody wants to go there and be like them. Look what happens to them. Jesus spoke of the little flock. A faithful man of God would rather preach the pure truth to 40 or 50 people than a compromised message to 40 or 50,000. 
Hebrews tells us there will be a shaking in the last days. When the shakings come, which church do you think is going to stand? The faithful one? Or the one who compromises for the sake of numbers and money? Now, I'm not putting down the numbers or financial blessing if God prospers a church as long as it's scriptural. But when truth is compromised, when anointing is replaced with hype, when worship is replaced with entertainment, when exposition of God's word is replaced with motivational speaking, oh, you can get the people in. You can get them in. But you're not going to be able to keep them long term. Sooner or later. Pop. I've seen this time at the time. I've seen churches in England do this. America. I see how big that we got a thousand. Now we got two thousand. Now they're empty. Quite a thing. Quite a thing indeed. Well. We have to get on with what Jesus is calling us to do. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Verse 10, I was in the spirit in the Lord's day and I heard him back of me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. The voice of God is represented by different sounds in biblical typology in different contexts. Here it's a trumpet. Other places it would be the sound of many rushing waters. When God is speaking to or through nations, his voice is compared to the sound of rushing waters. Other places, other contexts, it's thunder. The voice of God is represented by thunder. When you hear thunder, it's that only the people of God will understand what's being said. Other people will just hear the noise. They'll know something's going on, but they won't know what it means. Only the faithful people of God will hear what God is saying. This is a general truth. You can pick up a newspaper and look at a headline about the Middle East, and the world will know something's happening in the Middle East, but only the faithful people of God will know this fulfills prophecy. The others will just hear the noise. But when it's a trumpet, it's a signal that something is going to happen. And so it's a trumpet, and it's associated with the return of Jesus. Turn with me, please. The first Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. There it is again. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, literally raptured, harpezo, snatched away, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. There's the trumpet again. Look with me please to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The resurrection chapter. Verse 51, please. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye in the last trumpet. There it is again. For the trumpet will sound. There it is again. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortality put on immortality. Trumpet, trumpet, trumpet. Look with me, please, to the Olivet Discourse. Let's look at Matthew 24, please. Matthew 
verse 31. <clears throat> and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet. And they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. Repeatedly, the New Testament associates the return of Jesus with the blast of a trumpet. Repeatedly. Repeatedly. How are we meant to understand this? I hope this works. <coughs> it's orange, we don't have enough. <laughs> we have two trumpets in Scripture, two different instruments that make two entirely different, distinctly different sounds. One is called Shofar, Shofar. A Shofar is a ram's horn. It's something that God makes, not people. And it makes one kind of sound. The other in Hebrew, it's two of them, Hutzatzot, but in the Septuagint and in the New Testament, it is <laughs> Salapigo. Salapigo. It is a metallic trumpet. Usually, well, made of silver. It's a trumpet made of silver. So the pico is the silver one, made by human craftsmanship, but the shofar is a ram's horn created directly by God. Which of these two trumpets is the one going to be blown, heralding the parousia, the return of Christ, the rapture, and the resurrection? Which of the two? They're both trumpets. Both of these trumpets are important eschatologically in prophecy. I've explained before, perhaps some of you have heard it. My apologies if you already do. <coughs> Shofar was, of course, what was blown in Jericho when the walls came tumbling down. Joshua. A Jewish believer in Jesus at the end of the first century, reading the book of Revelation, would have read it and understood it quite differently than most Christians would today. A Jewish believer reading the book of Revelation at the end of the first century, say from chapters 8 through 11, would have said that the book of Revelation from chapters 8 to 11 is what is known as a Pesher interpretation, a Pesher interpretation of the book of Joshua. Joshua is the Peshet, from the Hebrew word Peshut, meaning simple. But the second meaning, the recapitulated fulfillment of it, is the Pesher. This Jewish believer at the end of the first century who got a, just got a copy of John's revelation from Patmos, he would have said, well, in Jericho, they had to be totally silent when they marched around Jericho. And then in Revelation chapter 1, there's total silence. How you apply time to eternity is another issue. I won't open that Pandora's box tonight, but there is silence. In Jericho, he would say, gee, I noticed they marched around seven days. But the seventh day, they had to do it seven times. So there's a subset of seven coming from the seventh of the sevens. 
Seven days, but on the seventh day, seven times. And Revelation, well, the seven seals. But from the seventh of the seven seals is seven trumpets, a subset of seven coming from the seventh of the first set of sevens. Follows the same numerical pattern. Relates to something called the Shemitah, but we won't talk about that tonight for the sake of brevity. Many people prefigure and foreshadow the two witnesses of Revelation 11. People ask, is it Moses and Elijah, Moses and Enoch, things like this in the Middle East? Some believers think that one of them could be the Apostle John. But many people foreshadow them. The two olive branches in Zechariah chapter 4 foreshadow those two witnesses. Yeshua, not Jesus, the other Yeshua, and Zerubbabel foreshadow those two witnesses from Zechariah. The two angels who rescued Lot and his family foreshadow those two witnesses rescuing the people of God before the destruction. So, the two men are grind, the two spies in the book of Joshua foreshadow the two witnesses. Remember the two spies rescued the Gentile woman and her family. These two witnesses are active during the first half of the last seven years. They're active during the first half. And they're going to play a role in rescuing the Gentile woman, the church. You understand the church is the Gentile woman. Well, when they blow the last trumpet at Jericho, the last blast, This city has been given to us by the Lord. Canaanites are defeated. This land has been given to us by the Lord. In the book of Revelation, they blow the last blast. This world has become the kingdom of our God and his Messiah. It follows the same pattern, you understand? The peshet, the simple, and the pesher, the deeper meaning prophetically. Now there's a lot to be said about this subject. We have tapes and things teaching about it. But that is how a Jewish believer would have read that and understood that in the first century. This is obviously a shofar, a ram's horn. Could the ram's horn be the horn for the rapture and resurrection? <clears throat> no, it cannot be. It has a future meaning, prophetically, it has a future significance, but it could not be the horn of the resurrection. Because the ram's horn is blown ritually at Rosh Hashanah. And it is blown on the Day of Atonement on the year of Jubilee. You can know the exact day and hour it's going to be blown. But we cannot know the day or hour of the Lord's return. It cannot possibly be the shofar. It must be the sort of people. Everybody understand? Yes. The rat's horn is blown at fixed times that every Jew knows. They can't be that. So that leaves us with the silver trumpets, the solipigo. Turn with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 10. The Lord spoke further to Moses, saying, Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Unlike the ram's horn, 
people were to be involved in proclaiming what the signal was. Silver, in biblical typology, is one of the three precious metals used in the construction of the temple and the tabernacle. The first is Nehoshet, brass, like the brazen altar and the lavender. As you proceed into the temple, to the holy place, it's more silver. When you get to the holy of holies, it's all pure, unbeaten gold. Gold is not oxidizing. It will not corrode. It will not rust. Hence, it represents that which is eternal. In the Holy of Holies, everything is gold. Silver, although it will not, strictly speaking, oxidize, it will sulfurize. Silver has to do with the price of salvation. Silver represents something about salvation. It goes back to the half shekel of silver for the firstborn. Jesus being the firstborn of the Father. You know the rank of the half shekel for the firstborn. Jesus was betrayed for silver. Silver has to do with salvation. Before man falls, you don't see silver in Genesis, and after all things are restored, you don't see it. It's a temporary value. It's a precious metal but not as precious as gold. It's a value now. The Hebrew word for silver is kesef. The word for gold is zahav, and the word for brass is nehoshet. But silver is kesef. Not only is kesef the Hebrew word for silver, it is the Hebrew word for money. How much money do you have? How much silver do you have? Same word in both ancient and modern Hebrew for money and silver. Same word. The world uses people to get Kesef. The world uses people to get money. God uses money to get people. Say it again. The world uses people to get money. God uses money to get people. To, he prospers us to invest in missions and evangelism and so forth. Worldly churches use people. Naive, undiscerning Christians will seek to tell evangelist con artists perverting the word of God to line their own pockets. But those who prostitute the word of God, worldly churches, use people to get money. God uses money to get people. Always the opposite. So it has to do with salvation and something we invest in. It's a signal. We should be telling people something is coming. This is what Jesus called the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? How do you evangelize people in a post-Christian, neo-pagan world when people are so apathetic? Now, in Ireland, you have an opportunity. The younger generation of Irish people are more educated, generally, than their parents and grandparents. The Roman Catholic Church does not have the same grip on the minds of the young people it did when I was a kid. When I was a kid, Neville Larry, my fellow New Yorker, was alive. It was very different in Ireland. Ireland was ruled from the news. They controlled everything. The media, education, they controlled the way people thought through the Irish government. That was all the whole thing. Then a foil, then a gale, then be somebody better to vote for. <laughs> it's very different now. Young people think for themselves and they see the scandals of the priests and nuns molesting the kids and the bishops and cardinals covering it up. They all know it. They don't blindly have the same allegiance as their parents. They see through the hypocrisy for what it is. Ireland's a bit different. There's an opportunity here 
because young people are so disgusted with the Roman church they found out the truth about it. They may not like the parties up north, but they know the orange men were right about Rome. <laughs> That's what it comes to. It's all corrupt. They know it. Young people know it. It's only their parents who don't want to know it, or their grandparents don't just go to the chapel and not think. But basically, the Western world is post-Christian. How do you evangelize a post-Christian civilization? People want to know the future. That's why they go to fortune tellers. Why they are into horoscopes and astrology and all this nonsense and these demonic occult things. They want to know the future. We know the future. The gospel of the kingdom is what John the Baptist preached. Repent, the kingdom is at hand. You see it in Matthew. When Jesus spoke of hell three times as much as he did heaven. What is the gospel of the kingdom? When you use prophecy, present the gospel for unsaved people. When you use prophecy, eschatology. People want to know the future. We know it. You show unsaved people, look what's happening in Europe. Do you think this is just our fight, how do you find or sign anything? That's where you think we have the euro and get rid of the pot. Read Daniel's prophecy. Those countries of the Roman Empire are coming together. <laughs> look at the Middle East. Look. Look at it. Jesus said when the Jews are back in Jerusalem, that's the beginning of the end. Look at it. We use prophecy. Now that's what Jesus said to do. The gospel of the kingdom must be preached. So because prophecy is the way Jesus said to evangelize in the last days. The devil does not want the church to do it. And all these stating facts. So you have people like Rick Warren teaching. That's what he teaches. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion. It's on his website. Wait a minute. Jesus said twice. Be alert. Watch for these signs. Don't forget what Jesus said. We don't need the New Testament. We have the purpose-driven life. Rick Warren said don't do it. Who needs the New Testament if you have the purpose-driven life? He directly contradicts the commands of Jesus. Directly. And he has a global peace plan. We have to unite with other religions to bring in global peace. Moses said other gods are demons. Shadim in Hebrew. False as other gods are demons. The mono in Greek. All right, Krishna's a demon. How is a demon? Rick Warren says we have to unite with demon worshippers to bring in global peace. What's he doing? He's setting the stage for the Antichrist, isn't he? Mm -hmm. False beings. He's being supported by Piper and all these people. Mark Driscoll teaches young people to mock prophecy and to mock those who study it. Now, again, I'm not throwing mud at these guys. I'm only telling you what they say. It's on their websites. Go look at it. Don't take my word for it. This is what they're saying. So Jesus is giving one message. The New Testament gives one message about prophecy, but the popular message being fed to young Christians today is the opposite. You have to decide who you want to listen to. The silver trumpet is made by human agency. We are supposed to proclaim the message. The Lord is coming. Something's going to happen. When the mess, when the People in the city hear the trumpet. Will they not tremble? In Amos, set the trumpet to your mouth. Well, that's what the scripture says. The purpose driven and all that it says, don't do that. Well, let's look. Make yourself two trumpets of silver. Of hammered work you shall make them. You shall use them for summoning the congregation and having the camps set out. Notice they're there for convocation and as a signal to leave. They're there for convocation and as a signal to leave and they have a third and a fourth purpose as we'll see in a moment. When both are blown all the congregation shall gather themselves to you at the doorway of the tent of meeting. When both 
So the peoples are blown simultaneously. God wants to speak to everybody. Verse 4, yet if only one is blown, then the leaders, the heads of the divisions of Israel, shall assemble before you. If it's one, God wants to speak to the leaders. Theoretically, the leaders should know what's going to happen before the people. The generals should know what's going to happen before the troops. But when you blow an alarm, the camps that are pitched on the east side shall set out. So we have convocation, alarm, and a signal to leave. When you blow an alarm the second time, the camps that are pitched on the south side shall set out. An alarm is to be blown for them to set out. Notice the first trumpet is for the people who are on the east side to leave. The second or the last trumpet is for the people on the south to leave. Have any of you been to Jerusalem? You know that the configuration, you were there with me, weren't you? The configuration of modern Jerusalem the old city is the same as the ancient city in the day of Jesus. <coughs> to this day, the necropolis, the dead people, are buried on the east side. In the Kidron Valley, between the Mount of Olives, Har Zayatim, and the Temple Mount. We know where Absalom's pillar is. It's a Hasmonean structure built on the traditional site of where he is on the east side. And about five years ago, four and a half to five years ago, Archaeologists found the tombs of the kings of Israel on the east side. We know Jesus would have come through the cleft of the Mount of Olives for the triumphal entry because he couldn't come in contact with the uh, ossuaries, with, with the bones of the dead. In other words, the dead people, then and now, live on the east side. The east side is the necropolis. The south side is where the original city of David is, built on top of the Jebusite city. It is to the south. To the south of the Temple Mount is where the people who are alive live. <coughs> on the east is where the dead people are. With the first trumpet, the people on the east <coughs> With the second trumpet, the people on the south set out. What does Paul say? The dead in Christ rise first. At the last trumpet, then we who remain. Now let's continue. Convocation. Signal to leave. Let's look at verse 7. When convening the assembly, however, you shall blow without sounding an alarm. Gunfire or a terrorist attack. 
Drop your wallet on the street in Dublin. Good luck, you're going to need it. You better go to the novena. It's a hopeless case. Drop your wallet or your purse on the street in Tel Aviv. It'll be there in 10 minutes later. So will the bomb squad. <laughs> no false alarms. No false alarms. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 8, the priestly sons of Aaron, moreover, shall blow the trumpets, and this shall be for you a perpetual statute throughout your generations. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, when you're attacked, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets that you may be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness and in your appointed feasts and on the first days of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. They shall be as a reminder of you before your God, I am the Lord your God. Notice the silver trumpets were blown ritually at the beginning of a 28-day lunar cycle of the month. Everybody, everybody had to know ahead of time, the Levites had to make sure everybody knew whether it was a shofar or a sorapigo. Is that the shofar being blown? Or is it the silver trumpet? They had to know which instrument. And they had to know ahead of time which signal. It was a good warning system. It worked well, providing that people knew the signals ahead of time. Today in Israel, there's an air raid system. Places that are hit by Katusha rockets, by Hamas, near the Gaza Strip, like Storot, places hit by Hezbollah up on the Lebanese border, like Matula and Kiryat Shmona. When there's a test of the air raid system, it's announced on TV the day before, on the radio, and on the internet, and in all the newspapers, there'll be a test tomorrow, 1 o'clock, hypothetically. If those alarms go off at any other time, the teachers get all the children into the air raid shelter, underneath the school, every school has one, and they distribute the gas masks. No false alarms. Everybody knew the signals, everybody knows the signals ahead of time, and there's no false alarms. Convocation, signal to leave, an alarm but no false alarms, which instrument is being played and which signal? Look very briefly at 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 14. Verse 7, if even a lifeless thing, either a flute or harp, is producing a sound, that they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? Which instrument is being played? You have to know ahead of time, and you have to know the signals. Is it a convocation? Does God want to speak to the leaders, or does he want to speak to everybody? 
Now that's the way it's supposed to work. What we have today is a situation where prophecy is being ignored, even though Jesus emphasized it, even though Paul emphasized it, even though Peter emphasized it, even though John emphasized it, even though the Hebrew prophets emphasized it, Rick Warren says we don't need it. Choose to stay who you will serve. You can be a follower of Jesus Christ or you can be a follower of Rick Warren, but you cannot follow both. They give diametrically conflicting instructions. I'm only stating a fact. Go to his website. Watch for yourself. Are the leaders being taught to recognize the signals? No. Are the people being taught to recognize the signals? No. Are there false alarms? Well, let's see. We had the Y2K crackpot scaremongering false alarms. Then in 1987, some fundamentalist Baptists from the States published a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in Yom Kippur of 1987. <coughs> When he didn't show up, they did the Jehovah's Witness thing. He said, we got the year wrong. <laughs> they moved the goalposts like the Jehovah's Witnesses and said, no, it's 1988. Did you say he was Jehovah's Witness? Okay. Then we had the Howard, Howard Camping. Three times that guy said Jesus was coming and set the dates. And people believed them. Each time they believed them. Now, unsaved people didn't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> they had more sense. Jesus said that. The sons of darkness are shorter than the sons of light. Unsaved people see right through con artists and evangelists. Unsaved people know that they're con men. You understand? It takes a born-again Christian to be that thick. There's very few unsaved people capable of being that undiscerning and that stupid. It takes a Christian to be that That should not be the case. Jesus said we should be innocent as doves, but wise as serpents. We should be as wise as the one who's out to deceive us. The sons of darkness are shrewder than the sons of light, Jesus said. That's what he said. Unsaved people see right through the con artists when they preach. They see right through crackpots who set dates. Well, who's the latest? Now, the one presently, the flavor of the month of the blood moons. We've already had one of them. The blood moon. They're having conferences about the blood moon. They're having books and recordings and films about the blood moon. Because these eclipses are happening on Hebrew holy days. There's a problem. All anybody had to do was go on the NASA website and see that those eclipses were not even visible in Israel. There was no eclipses on the Hebrew holy days. Only one of them was even partially visible in the Middle East. You had to go to Tahiti or Fiji, the South Pacific, to see those things. Crackpots, nonsense, false alarms. What happens when you have people blowing false alarms? You have the boy who cried wolf. So when the real thing happens, and sane Christians who are biblically based try to warn People just think it's more nonsense. That's what you wind up with, the boy who cried wolf syndrome. That's why the devil raises up these crackpots with their nonsense. Y2K and all this rubbish. Signal to leave! How 
can you be rescued if you don't know there's a rescue? Yeah. I'm only stating facts now. A proven false prophet, a man who predicts things in the name of the Lord that fails to happen in America, Rick Joyner, says the rapture is a lie of the devil. Another proven false prophet in Great Britain, Gerald Coates, says the rapture is a fantasy and a myth. Mike Pickle, another proven false prophet. These are people who are, by biblical definition, proven to be false prophets. They predicted specific things, time specific, in the name of the Lord that failed to happen. Mike Pickle says the rapture of Elijah was God's judgment on Elijah. The rapture is a myth. Now you got that other one. What's his name? Jackson? John Paul Jackson, another one. I hell had Paul Cain. Homosexual and alcoholic. These are their prophets. Jesus warned false prophets are going to come in the last days to deceive the elect, and it is happening. They're all over the place. They're denying there even is a rapture. So you got people saying, keep away from prophecy, denying there is a rapture, and the ones who are saying there is are blowing false alarms. What a mess. Either they're not blowing the trumpet when they should, and the ones who are blowing the trumpet are blowing false alarms. That's pathetic. That's pathetic. I've told you the bad news. Now I'll tell you the worst news. <laughs> Turn with me, please, once again to 1 Corinthians 14, please. Verse 8, for if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? If the son of Pigo is blown, but the signal is indistinct. Who's going to know what to do? Now the issue Paul is addressing is charismania. The theological term is neomontanism. A misuse of the gifts of the spirit where they're being counterfeited. We have tongues that are not tongues. Prophecy that's not prophecy. Words of knowledge that are not real. This is not to deny what's real. It's just to say that most of what we see today is not real. Most of the tongues you see today is not real. Most of the prophecy you're hearing today is not real. Most of the words of knowledge are not real. Oh, there is a real. But the overwhelming majority is not authentic. It's not scriptural. It's not being practiced in a scriptural way. It's neo-Montanism. Charismania. That's the issue being addressed. If you don't know what the trumpet is playing, how are you going to know what to do, Paul says. He puts this into a military scenario. From the time of Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great, way back when, until about 110 years ago, until the beginning of the 20th century, military commands in the heat of battle were relayed by a trumpet. General or commanding officer would tell the trumpeteer to blow a certain signal. The troops had to know ahead of time how to identify those sounds. A battle is like a rugby game. It's naturally chaotic. It's a chaotic environment. And in the heat of battle, it's very difficult to keep any semblance of order. Commands are relayed above the blasts and shooting and so forth by trumpet up until about a hundred years ago, give or take. Soldiers were always trained. In fact, the British Army used to train in Tipperary. Not too far from here. They used, the British Army used to do huge maneuvers in Tipperary. And they'd be sh shoot off cannons and ordnance and practice hearing the signal of trumpets over the blasts. You know the song that's a long way to Tipperary that comes from World War I? It's 
Attack! Recall! Go to sleep! They know what to do from the trumpet! The Afro-American jazz great, Duke Ellington, was somebody who had become a saved Christian. Like so many black Americans, he had saved Christians in his family, but by the time he was a middle-aged guy, he was a practicing saved Christian himself. And he did Christian as well as secular music. I once met a guy in New York from his orchestra. He wouldn't allow gambling and things like this in his orchestra. He was a Christian. Duke Ellington was the pioneer of something that became known as the big band sound. White people like Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman began to imitate the sound that was developed by Duke Ellington and his composer Billy Strayhorn. It became the big bad sound where people would have these huge ballroom concerts where people would dance, thousands of them would dance. And a couple of them, the, the Irish ones, the Dorsey brothers, their parents were from here. They imitated Duke Ellington. They got it from Duke Ellington mainly. But Duke Ellington lamented what happened to jazz. He said jazz stopped being fun when people couldn't dance to it anymore. And he was right. Jazz began in New Orleans in the American South. It was music that came from the gospel tradition. They had these huge choirs. And the choir would know from the tempo of the music how to move. We think of these things as fun songs, but it was their worship music. Josh was the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Josh was the battle of Jericho, the walls came to the Head bone connected to the neck bone, neck bone connected to the neck bone, shoulder bone connected to the hand bone, we'll hear the word of love, them bones, them bones, them bones. Straight from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 30. You know, when the saints go marching in, straight from the book of Nehemiah and the book of Revelation. We don't think of it as, we think of it as entertainment, but for the people who began, that was church music. That's how it began. Well, they took the choir out and they brought in that brass rhythm section. But they played the same kind of music. So the same as the choir knew how to move, people knew how to dance. If it was a two-step or, or, or it was a jitterbug or whatever they knew from the music. This was the big band sound. But a guy came along, or I must admit was a rather clever musician, his name was John Coltrane. And he had a philosophy of music that was similar to the music of India, where there was no structure. He said jazz should be improvisational. You'd make it up as you went along. They had these sessions called jamming, jam sessions. He had just called them sessions, don't you? We just have a guy with a stand up bass. <laughs> Instead of having a drummer, the drummer would play with brushes so he could fill him with anything. And whatever the beat was, he would just fill him with it. A guy, a guy with a pen of sax would do this, and a guy with a clarinet would do that. They would make it up as they went along. People couldn't dance to this music anymore. It became known as musicians' music. Jazz became musicians' music because the only people who could appreciate it were the musicians playing it. And a handful of aficionados who were largely nuts, they, they became like the beatniks and stuff like that. They were bohemian types, you know. I didn't say they were nuts, but they were just, you know, <laughs> well, let's say bohemian oddballs or whatever they were. But it was not something people could dance to. So people in America turned to rhythm and blues and rock and roll because they could dance to that, you see. And Duke Ellington bemoaned this. Well, fast forward. 
So in a military situation, and in the heat of battle, prevailing chaos, a general gives a command. Tell them to recall. But suppose the trumpeteer decides to do his Dizzy Gillespie imitation. <laughs> suppose the bugler decides to do his Miles Davis impersonation. <laughs> and he begins to improvise. What is going to happen on the battlefield? What is already by nature a chaotic situation is going to immediately and automatically disintegrate into utter, utter pandemonium. That's what Paul says. Well, that's what you got today. Crazy people going around giving prophecies that aren't prophecies. The whole Bill Johnson thing or the John Paul Jackson thing, and I had a picture, I had a vision, I had a word, it's all mysticism. They think it's spirituality, but it's mysticism. None of it's scripturally based. They have no scriptural compass for where they're going or what they're doing. God's not going to give a prophecy to somebody who's not well-grounded in doctrine. They wouldn't have a way to test it and know if it was real. What a mess. Total mess. Forget about the convocation. They don't want to know about prophecy, what God is saying. Neither the leaders nor the people. They're not being taught it. Signal to leave, the rapture is being denied, even mocked. False alarms, plenty of those. Blood moon, Y2K, pick your pick. They don't even know which instrument or which signal. That is one heck of a mess. That is a formula for an ecclesiological disaster. That's the bad news. And that's the worst news. Now, I'll tell you the good news in conclusion. Once again, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Also in the day of your gladness. In the day of your gladness? What on earth is there to be glad about? Within three weeks of each other, the biggest evangelical church in America and the biggest evangelical church in Asia are struck by incredible scandal with the heads of their respective pastors rolling in public. They had gladness. Mark Driscoll caught in a scandal. Look at they had gladness. False prophets, false doctrines, lunacy, craziness of every description. Day of gladness? What is there to be glad about? Why can we blow a trumpet in the day of gladness when there's nothing visibly to be glad about? Oh, yes, there is. Jesus said, this stuff was going to happen. Disturbing and painful as it is, he told us it was going to be like this. What's there to be glad about? Because Jesus said, when you see these things happening, lift up your head and rejoice. For your redemption draweth near. That trumpet is going to sound. God bless.